quick about kind of where I am and what took me into cannabis tourism. Um, I was born and raised in Northern California, spent a lot of my life with a backpack on traveling um, and arrived back in California in my early 30s to discover that there were dispensaries and shop and cannabis shops. Um, and it was really obvious to me that this was kind of the next frontier, which sent me down the rabbit hole of meeting Dennis Perone, a lot of the pioneers, Pebbles Trippet, um, spending, a, spending a good amount of time in Humboldt and Mendocino and the Emerald Triangle as well. Um, really falling in love with the culture. Very, it really reminded me of the expat communities that I spent a lot of time in when I was kind of wandering um, around the world and uh, really had an affinity for. Um, and of course, growing up in Northern California, cannabis was as common as beer at a high school party um, when, I was, when I was growing up. So um, it, I, felt like, I feel like this is a blessing and a privilege to be part of this industry. Um, and I enrolled in Oaksterdam and, and kind of down the rabbit hole I went. I fell in love with cannabis and hemp. And I think that these plants are, are resurfacing um, in a kind of a divine way right now to act as tools to really move the needle forward in, in kind of multiple ways. Um, so anyways, with that being said, um, this presentation is about cannabis tourism, opportunities, issues, and strategies. And we'll go ahead and jump in. So this first slide, you know, I really wanted to kind of level set, I guess, when it came to the state of tourism as well as kind of Hawaii and what, what could the opportunity be and continually tie that back in. Um, so just a little bit of data out of the gate. In 2019, there was about 10.5 million visitors that arrived in Hawaii. Um, it makes up about 21% of the state's economy. Visitors spend, you know, upward toward 18 billion um, in 2019. Uh, 2020, of course, wow, what a historical and, and arguably devastating year um, for the tourism, travel, hospitality industry. Um, you know, in the first nine months of 2020, the total visitor arrivals declines over 70%, um, a little over 2 million visitors uh, as of September to the island, islands. Um, and then in September 2020, um, a total of 18,868 visitors came to Hawaii compared to 736,000 plus the year before. So, and that really, I want to take that moment though and segue into the new kid on the block, which is cannabis and hemp tourism, which is an essential designation, which has proved itself recession proof, which is setting record sales right now, and which has absolutely rich culture and history. And it's this untapped asset that is quickly emerging. And as we rebuild and rethink the funding sources of DMOs, um, the presence of cannabis and hemp in the tourism conversation as part of the tourism ecosystem. What role can cannabis and hemp play in the rebuilding of this industry that's been devastated as an essential business that's recession proof? And there's really three things I wanna to touch on. There's the essential designation. Most of the funding for destinations for marketing comes from ho uh, hotel assessments, whether it's a tourism improvement district or, or some, kind of, some kind of assessment that's taken typically at the hotel, which funds the marketing of the destination, the brand of the destination, the brand pillars of the destination. Um, as we rethink this, it's interesting, and I think it's, worth, it's a worthy conversation of, you know, the, the dispensaries that really consider themselves as part of the tourism ecosystem and want a seat at the table to work with hotels and attractions and restaurants that really cater to visitor visitation and tourists, is there an opportunity to um, fold them into the funding model of, of the destination as well and bring value in that way, considering they're more stable in times of crisis? The second thing I want to impress around essential designation and cannabis tourism is that cannabis is a differentiator. It's a new product. There's a lot of curiosity around it. It has this kind of surprise and delight element that is really tipping into mainstream and people want to understand the health and wellness and what is cannabis? How can I use it to improve quality of life? So it's, it's kind of a differentiator at this moment for destinations, hotels and other and dispensaries and cannabis operators that are willing to really include a strategy around tours and travel, hospitality and visitation. And three, cannabis research shows that the cannabis motivated travel audience is an active traveler. They move around a destination, they spend money, they book more trips every year than the 
average leisure traveler in the United States. So this is a this is a this is an audience that that travels more often, is active, spends more. We're going to look at some data on that. Um, and the other photo on this slide is just kind of showing the ecosystem. Tourism really is from airline to cannabis lounges to dispensaries to hotels to museums and art exhibits and and to foodie experiences. It, it's it's an ecosystem where cannabis operators also need to understand that and what that means to be part of that. Um, so with that, we're going to go to the next slide. Um, so this next slide is really about cannabis-related tourism. Um, and uh, this is somewhat of level setting as well, I think, just kind of getting us on the same page before we dive into the data. Um, so cannabis-related tourism, the first two parts that are essential that everybody address now. Sorry about that one second. <sighs> okay. Um, so... There's no reason right now for any, any, any kind of destination or municipality that has any kind of legalization, medical or rec. Uh, there's a responsibility, in my opinion, that people need to become educated, businesses need to become educated, and there needs to be a risk mitigation plan. And I wanna tell you a couple stories real quick. I worked with a hotel in Santa Monica um, that was a four or five star hotel. And uh, when I pulled up to Valet, I, you know, part of the work I do is I kind of do an audit or do an assessment of the grounds and the hotel and the operations prior to developing a plan. And when I pulled up to Valet, I asked the Valet, you know, where can I get some weed? And of course, they recommended a platform that is notorious for enabling unlicensed operators, which leads to untested medicine, which leads to exponential risk that your staff is recommending a traditional market delivery with potentially untested products. And the only reason this exists is a lack of pro being proactive and having a plan and SOPs developed around this. Another story um, that, I, that I could share with you is, you know, there's a hotel where they, they've had ambulances, of course, for people taking kind of too high of a dose. Also, they have people that are, you know, ordering cannabis or bringing cannabis back to their rooms. And then the maid is cleaning and takes a piece of chocolate and is asleep three doors, five doors down. And this is yet again, and there's no disposal plan. So I guess the moral of the story is education, knowing what your options are and mitigating risk, especially in the, in kind of the, under the guise of hospitality um, is a really important kind of first step that everybody needs to be taking. And then when it comes to the actual positioning, there's really three different options. Um, or three different considerations that should be had. There's hemp, which is really a values-based strategy around sustainability using hemp toilet paper, hemp towels, hemp sheets. Um, and this is also very attractive for the travelers today, leaving a low footprint and being, being cognizant and, and, and intentional around that is becoming more and more of a trend. Um, so just integrating hemp in a, under, the, under the kind of the narrative of sustainability is a great consideration for any operation. The next one is CBD, which really I kind of speak to that as in terms of well being and quality of life. This also dovetails into medical cannabis tourism and what can medical cannabis tourism exist as, as a quality of life tool. Um, and there's a lot of ways, whether it's PTSD, stress, um, some of the women's health issues that May was sharing with us. Um, there's a lot of opportunities for well, wellness tourism and medical tourism to be very vibrant and unique and really attract this visitation. We'll also see here in a couple slides that a large um, discovery in the research that I did is that this interest of cannabis as a tool for health and quality of life and wellness is a recurring theme. So the audience and the sub-segments of the cannabis motivated travel audience, that idea is very present. Um, and then the third category is cannabis as an elevated experience, right? Like, you know, the THC, THC molecule, you know, as Swami calls it, my friend here up in Mendo, it's the everyday psychedelic. It's really all about dosing. So it's getting the dosing down where cannabis is used as an enhancement tool to really amplify different experiences or activities while you're on vacation or traveling, like food and art and nature. Um, so we're going to dive into each of those a little bit more. Okay, so this next slide is uh, the first of three kind of slides that I grabbed out of the, the public facing research that I did. Now this report was brought to fruition by MMGY Travel Intelligence, which is really, they consider themselves the global leader 
of travel intelligence and, uh, and data-driven marketing. Um, and my company, uh, which is Enlightened Strategies, and we really work on um, coordinating destinations and hotels and businesses and helping facilitate kind of the opportunity, um, making sure that it's on brand and we're mitigating risk and whatnot. So anyways, this was a national survey. There was over 1,500 people surveyed throughout the United States in different markets. And what we discovered is 29% of all the active leisure traveler audience in the United States, 29% of those people qualified as a cannabis motivated traveler in some capacity. And if you look at the survey methodology, you'll see these different experiences. And long story short, the respondents that took the survey expressed interest in one of these. And you'll notice that we really did a temperature check on hemp and CBD and wellness as well as cannabis. So we could help make sense of this. Um, the next slide is a little bit more information about the cannabis motivated travel audience. So on the left hand side, you can see that the these travels, these travelers, these, this travel audience self describes as foodies and beach bums and outdoor adventurers and wine enthusiasts. Um, and this is important to understand. And as it relates to Hawaii, I mean, I really see beach bum and outdoor adventurer as well as foodie all playing into this. Um, and this just helps inform different businesses on how they can start reaching this audience and kind of what the self descriptions are of this, of this profile. Um, and then of course, on the right hand side, we have one third of the travelers have never consumed cannabis previously, which was a great discovery, right? You have this cannabis motivated traveler profile and one third of the 29% haven't even tried cannabis yet, but they're extremely interested in doing so. So it's a really interesting audience that's, that is uh, waiting to be connected with and drawn to it. This, this third slide is about the interest and the consumption of the cannabis motivated travel audience. Um, this is really important because the hotels and some of the destinations that I've worked with here in California, you know, there's a big concern about smokes, clouds of smoke, inhalation, vaporization. Um, you know, there's some municipalities here in California where smoking is just outright not allowed in the, in the entire jurisdiction. Um, and it's not just located to a hotel. So that what we discovered here is that actually the smoking vaping ranked the lowest as of uh, the preferred method of ingestion for this cannabis motivated travel audience in the national lens. So what this says to hotels and destinations is, listen, the stigma of clouds of smoke, the lazy stoner stigma, it's not true. It's an active traveler. And this traveler maybe hasn't tried cannabis. And not only that, but they don't want to smoke it. They want to eat it and probably in microdosable form. So then you start thinking about all the opportunities, which leads us to the cannabis related activity of greatest interest to this travel audience, um, which you'll notice are visiting a cannabis dispensary. Um, trying a CBD or THC infused edible, a beverage is next, a spa treatment. And then the fifth one's really important because that says a safe environment. Now, how often do you see something in travel where in the top five activities, it mentions just having the confidence that it's safe, which is really interesting when you start considering the COVID-19 landscape and how paramount public health and safety is, as well as thinking about the communication plans for destinations that are willing to outwardly draw this audience toward them. And what I mean by that is there's some destinations here in California that have not embraced, even though their, their jurisdiction has a lot of um, dispensaries that are very innovative and leading the state, they, they have some kind of nimbyism or issue with really incorporating cannabis hemp into their model because they're really fighting against this this inaccurate stigma that still lingers. Um, and we need to overcome that. And part of that is being able to, one, get the stakeholders on board, but two, just having a basic communication plan, letting travelers know that, hey, we have a licensed lounge here or multiple lounges or multiple dispensaries, and it's totally safe to come here and purchase and consume cannabis. That alone is a marketing tool right now for destinations and hotels willing to adopt it. So that's just a couple little insights. Anyone who's interested in seeing more of this information, feel free to email me after this presentation. And I'm happy to share with you about 30 to 40 slides that go a little bit more in depth. Um, and this is the last kind of data slide. So the interest and concerns. 
So these travelers are leisure, leisure travelers. Um, these travelers are more active leisure travelers uh, than those who are not interested in the cannabis experience. So once again, I, I kind of touched on this earlier. They, the cannabis motivated travel audience takes more trips, right? So they're an active travel audience. They have a high kind of curiosity about the health benefits of consuming cannabis related products. Um, and they do have concern about consumption. So to, to what I said on the last slide, just being able to communicate that this is a safe location where it's legal and you can access safe tested medicine and it's gonna be a normalized experience um, alone is somewhat of an attraction right now. Um, so that takes me kind of to the next slide, which where we dive a little bit deeper into the THC leaning component. And there's a lot of different methodologies that are emerging as there should be because cannabis is an incredibly evolved plant. It's incredibly flexible. THC could be used in high doses for, for kind of mental health and wellness or this more microdosing concept where people just use it kind of as an enhancement tool to reach flow state. And I wanted to share a little bit about this. This is a kind of a methodology that I've been working on, which is the method of effect pairing cannabis. And the idea, this is how I would like to see cannabis evolve, cannabis tasting and pairings evolve in tourism. Um, now effect pairing cannabis is the art of selecting and consuming a cannabis cultivar or product in an effort to optimally enhance an activity or experience. So that basically means that you're gonna to try to take a cannabis product or cultivar with the appropriate THC percentage or milligrams, as well as the appropriate terpene profile in an effort to supplement an activity. An example of this is cannabis cultivars with the mercine terpene profile on it. Research is still young, but there's patterns of that stimulating appetite which leads into tourism. What a great aperitivo to a Michelin star meal or to go to a luau with all the dancing and the art and the food and, and be able to use a cultivar prior to that to put you in a place where you can really be present and you can really soak in the culture and taste the flavors and the textures and, and really kind of enhance that experience with cannabis as a tool. Um, now let's talk a little bit about flow state. You'll see on this dosing scale, the effect pairing method, that the optimal zone you're trying to reach is right there in flow state. And flow state, so let's just pause for a second. When you think about alcohol, you know, there's those mornings when you wake up, you say, man, I had two drinks last night. I'm not hungover. I had a great company around me. It was perfect. And I feel great this morning, right? So it's like you nailed it. You're no, high, no hangover, none of that. The good news is cannabis, you don't have the hangovers you do with, with alcohol, um, but also kind of the equivalent to that kind of getting it spot on experience is attaining flow state with cannabis. And flow state is an optimal state of consciousness where sense of self, time, and space dissolve. And it's to feel present in the moment and completely immersed in an activity or experience. And when you use THC and when you understand how to dose cannabis with intention, it's a supplemental tool that can lead you to flow state and make music kind of more vibrant, make art more beautiful, make food more interesting, make nature feel more connected. And that is how I would like to see cannabis. This, again, this is just one of multiple methods being explored right now. Um, but I wanted to kind of share that for people that were curious about how that might evolve. Um, which leads me into the origin designations. So this is really exciting in California. Just recently on September 29th, and Holly Hall will be talking about this um, later on, I believe, today. And this is the Appalachians of California, the Cannabis Appalachians, and really the origin designations. Um, so I want, what I want to focus on is really there's three to consider. There's the geographic indicator designations, which is the city of origin and the county of origin designations. And then there's the Appalachian of origin, which is more of the terroir-based soil science microclimate. Now where tourism really overlaps with this discussion and why the California Cannabis Tourism Association, as well as any other kind of audience that I'm able to speak in front of, I bring this up, is because obviously Appalachians are gonna exist and as a tourism anchor and attraction to be able for the state of California, just like Napa Valley, to be able to utilize to draw visitation and have a place of source um, kind of Appalachian experience where you can really understand 
uh, not just the plant, but how it permeates throughout a community because it is a place of source. Um, now that how it permeates a community is really where the overlap is with the city of origin and county of origin, because you do have those stories of urban indoor cultivation that, you know, there's a story about why that happened and how indoor growing came about. Um, and really understanding what that means and being able to storytell about brands and quality of products, absolutely. But also about the cannabis story and the movement. It really intertwines with these designations as I see it when it comes to cannabis tourism. And when you look at the cultural overlap specifically, you know, we have the back to the land movement. The cannabis movement is very much a values based movement on self reliance and freedom. There was this utopian community stepping stone that was a phenomenon here in Sonoma County where I live in the Russian River and on the coast with Morningstar um, and, uh, and, and the Wheeler Ranch. Um, you have the regenerative agriculture narrative really teaching people about kind of diversity, biodiversity, low footprint, regenerative agriculture, sustainable practices. You know, Mendocino Humboldt and also where I live in, in West County Sonoma, there is really a lot of pride in hyper-local community and connectivity. Um, and of course the craft practices. I'll never forget one of my trips to Humboldt. I met up with one of, one of my grower friends who was showing me all the two by fours in his trees from you know, nailing those up so you could put pots in them. And, you know, and as a traveler and a person who loves storytelling and culture, hearing that story about those two by fours and the plants and what they did to hide from the, the raids and the helicopters. I mean, that is really sexy, cool tourism stuff. And that feeds right into the Appalachians and the city of origin. So I look at all of these going hand in hand. These are two infographics that I created. I'm really focused on building this thing called the cannabis trail, which I'm going to get into in a second, but there's a pioneer chart and a timeline. And this culture and history is absolutely vital to include in tourism strategy. Which leads me to my nonprofit, which is a 501c3. It's called the Cannabis Trail. And the Cannabis Trail's mission is to honor the pioneers, places, and benchmark moments that paved the way for legal cannabis access. Um, we believe those five things that cannabis, the story of cannabis can serve as a force for good. The values of the cannabis movement need to be shared with the world. The story of cannabis legalization is important to preserve, enshrine, and make accessible. We believe in generational storytelling through transformative self-guided experiences, art, and content. And educating about the different seasons of the movement is both important and compelling, um, which leads me to our four initiatives for the Cannabis Trail. And I speak about this because I believe the Cannabis Trail in tandem with the Appalachians are both gonna serve um, and support each other as cannabis tourism infrastructure where the state of California can really point to two different multi-county experiences and drive spend and economics and, and get people visiting and traveling and, and kind of lead in that space. So the four initiatives of the Cannabis Trail are the Monument Initiative. We're creating nine monuments that feature the value and principles of the legalization movement. The Designation Initiative, which honors the pioneers, places, and benchmark moments of the movement. And then the storytelling initiative where we create and share content, just like the infographics and the short films that I've done. And then of course the education initiative, which I'm really excited about. We're launching a cannabis culture certification and we're gonna be training people in industry about the movement. Um, so anyways, and then on the left-hand side, you'll see the map and some of the flags that I've thrown up there to help kind of paint a picture of what it's gonna look like. But the cannabis trail as it stands right now in California is envisioned to go from Santa Cruz up to Weaverville and Trinity County and the Emerald Triangle. That being said, Brent and I have spoken, you know, I wanna say at length, but we've spoken multiple times about how the cannabis history of Hawaii is amazing. And there's a lot there to unpack and it's very exciting. And there's also some things that very much mirror California with the back to the land movement. Um, and the and the cultivation, the land race strains, and we'll get to that right here. So this is the last slide. So this is just kind of key takeaways to recap the presentation. You know, the opportunity is here. So opportunity is this is an essential designation. It's setting record sales 
with a tourism industry that's trying to recalibrate and redesign as it rebuilds. It's an opportunity for people to differentiate whether you're a cannabis dispensary and lounge or whether you're a destination and hotel. Hemp, cannabis, and wellness, and medical tourism, it's a way to differentiate and attract this audience that research has identified that travel more and spend more. And then there's these incremental revenue opportunities. So if you're a hotel and you have a CBD you know, bar of soap in your lobby, it's a trending topic. You're gonna end up capturing sales there. Or even a hemp postcard with a picture of a beautiful Appalachian you know, on the big island where it captures the place of source, right, for this cannabis history. Um, the next section is issues, right? The issues that we have is this is still kind of marginalized travel, right? Like there's destinations are hesitating to pick it up. Hotels sometimes are kind of apprehensive about it. It reminds me of when the LGBT community was traveling in the 50s and it was this, or the Green Book, when the African American community was traveling and they had to have their own dedicated book to know where their safe spots were. This is an opportunity for people that are trend setting and forward thinking and ready to embrace this strategy to be able to attract this audience that's ready to travel. And lastly, there's risk, whether it's the house cleaner taking a chocolate or whether it's the ambulance coming to pick somebody up. I also spoke to a couple people in San Francisco. I speak to visitors occasionally where they go to a dispensary and they end up canceling their dinner plans because they had 25 milligrams. They didn't know what that meant. And they spend two days in their hotel. So that hospitality training of your staff, if you're a cannabis dispensary, is also important. Um, and that leads us to strategies. So education and risk mitigation is for everyone. You can have the basic hospitality plan where your concierge and frontline staff have answers to the 10 most basic questions of where can I get it, where can I use it, et cetera, what's legal. Um, and then there's a more robust strategy where you can actually entice the audience and you can create incremental revenue from it um, or take a real step forward and really be cannabis forward and be an anchor for the state as a cannabis attraction. Um, and then I did a little exercise with kind of Hawaii and looking at what are the pillars of the island when it comes to tourism, which is, of course, the culture, the preservation of natural resources and support a local community. So for Hawaii, in, this, in the time that I spent prior to this presentation, you know, rejuvenation, rest, relaxation, balance, island life, beach, spa, adventure, all those were the first words that came to mind when I thought of medical cannabis tourism. Um, and then, of course, you know, that enhancement tool, like think of all the food and the Halewa bowls and the art and the nature and the effect pairing of how cannabis can complement and, and, and kind of re-magnify or breathe new life into some of that. And then, of course, you have your strains, right? The Kona Gold, the Maui Waui. It's, it goes on and on, I'm sure. There's probably a handful not listed there, but that's really exciting stuff. And that dovetails into Appalachians. Of course, Operation Green Harvest, we have our own version of that here in Northern California, which is Operation Green Sweep. There was, also, there was also Operation Emerald Triangle. That's how it got its name. One of the first kind of raids was Operation Emerald Triangle in 1985, and that's how that region got named. Um, the uh, Puff the Magic Dragon, right? Can't leave that out. That's fun. So there's these, there's these opportunities. Um, that last one's really important, actually. So cannabis as a uniting cultural tool in the peace pipe. And from the research I did, the surf scene in the 50s, the hippies that came along with it. And then you had these native Hawaiians in the back to the land culture all kind of um, uniting through cannabis. And I would love to learn more about that story. But wow, what an amazing opportunity to fold all of this into the experience of coming to Hawaii. Now you do all the things that have always been there and now you have cannabis and hemp and other opportunities. Um, so this is my contact info. Uh, my company's Enlighten. Uh, cannabis Trail is my, a nonprofit and then effect pairing is my, my play space for my, my how I hope cannabis evolves into enhancing travel. Um, and I'm just really grateful to be a part of this. So, uh, Mahalo, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you guys might have.